Good morning. My name is Matthew Ichihashi Potts. I'm the plumber professor here at Harvard and the minister of this memorial church where we have gathered today to celebrate the life of Ashton Baldwin Car Carter and to seek the blessing of his memory. Ash Carter was a man, as you all know, of immense influence and consequence. Even at Harvard, it is rare to gather in memory of a man who has affected the world so much. By any measure, Ash Carter was a great man. But our measure here in the Memorial Church is not just any measure. The Christian tradition honors great deeds, to be sure, but it also recognizes the holy in ordinary things in the everyday acts of love and decency and dignity and integrity with which we can fill our days if we so choose. Goodness can be found in many parts of our lives, most especially in our everyday labors of love and habits of purpose. The world knew Ash Carter for good reason as a major public figure and an influential public servant through his admirable work in national and international affairs. But here in Cambridge and wherever around the world he encountered his former students, as Dean Elmendorf's initial remembrance let us know, he was Professor Carter, a brilliant scholar, a demanding teacher, a supportive mentor, and a collaborative colleague. His tireless energy had global impact to be sure. We have heard that impact attested in public memorials since his sudden death last fall. But Professor Carter's energy was meted out on a day-to-day -day basis to you. In his individual interactions with his colleagues and his students, in the daily work of building relationships, the daily work of doing the right thing. Indeed, what is so clear from all the remembrances of Ash Carter is how deeply devoted to doing the right thing he was, how deeply devoted to public service and to people he was. And what is also clear is how these devotions were true to him, not just in the grandiose principles of global scale, but also in his daily acts and relationships in the manner by which he lived his life each day. I teach at the Divinity School, and in the jargon of theology, we speak in the Christian tradition of outward and visible signs of inward and invisible grace. There are so many outward and visible signs of Ash Carter's brilliance, his leadership, his impact, all these global accomplishments his amazing career. There are so many signs that the world can see so clearly, but to those who knew him best, to his family, to his friends, to his students and close colleagues, to all those who knew, knew him not just as a global leader, but also and fundamentally as a person, as a human being, loving and beloved of other humans, Ash Carter was more than these outward signs. The parts of him which were far less visible to the world at large were no less visible to you and are no less blessed. These are the things which we gather today in this church to remember. These are the things we and you grieve losing. And these are the things for which we give our deep and lasting thanks this morning as we remember the life and legacy of Ash Carter. Let us pray. O oh, gracious love, we remember before you this day our brother Ash. We thank you for giving him to us, his friends, colleagues, and students to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Bless us with his memory and sustain us with his spirit, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call 
we are reunited with those who have gone before. Amen. I'd like to invite Dean Elmendorf to the lectern now. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this celebration of the life of Ash Carter, our colleague, teacher, mentor, and friend. We've gathered today to mourn the loss of Ash, which was so sudden and so devastating. Whenever I see his picture in the corner of the faculty photo board at the Kennedy School, I think again that this just can't be. Ash's family has suffered the worst blow, but all of us who knew him, learned from him, and worked with him will continue to grieve and feel the sorrow of his loss. But we are gathered today also to appreciate our amazing good fortune that Ash was part of our lives. I want to say a few words about that good fortune. I met Ash in 2016 at the Pentagon, where he was serving as Secretary of Defense. He became an important part of my life for six years, which feels far too short. Some of you knew him for less time than I did, and some for much, much longer. But I know we all feel that our time knowing him was too short. Ash's initial part of my life was uh, as a challenge. He had been a longtime central figure of Harvard Kennedy School, teaching numerous courses, mentoring many future leaders, and helping to develop our concentration in international and global affairs. My responsibility was to recruit him back to Harvard. And everyone made it clear that they would accept nothing but full success in that effort. Fortunately, I did succeed, not because of any special touch of my own, but because he wanted to come home here. He missed his faculty colleagues terribly, he missed the staff members with whom he had worked, and he missed our students. As I've said before, I want to emphasize, he was so proud in saying uh, about his travels as Defense Secretary that he could arrive at a base somewhere around the world and have someone not in the US military, but in some other country's government, come up to him and say, hello, Professor Carter. He wanted to come back to that. And so he returned to Harvard Kennedy School as Belfer Professor of Technology and Global Affairs and Director of our Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. When Ash returned, he played a different role in my life, that of a work partner. He helped increase funding for student financial aid. He and Eric Rosenbach, the co-director of the Belfer Center, teamed up with me and the academic deans on crucial faculty recruitment and retention efforts. And of course, Ash partnered with so many others around Harvard and beyond. He partnered with students through his classes on technology and public purpose, through policy analysis exercises and many informal interactions. He partnered with colleagues at the Belfer Center and elsewhere at the Kennedy School. He partnered with Frank Doyle, the dean of Harvard's Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, to convene experts from across Boston who think deeply about technology and society. He partnered with people at MIT in his role in the MIT Corporation and with many others. Beyond being initially for me a challenge and then a work partner, I think Ash's most important part of my life was as a model public servant. It is through public service, of course, that Ash became so well-known and admired beyond the Harvard campus. The United States and the world know Ash Carter for his lifelong efforts to serve this country, to stand up for the best values of this country, and to build a safer world for all people. At a memorial service at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. last month, I and many friends of Ashes listened to eulogies from President Biden, Defense Secretary Austin, and other leaders from government, nonprofits, and business.
But I want to emphasize the way in which Ash Carter was a model public servant for me and for all of us at Harvard. Ash was a model in his commitment to public service, taking breaks from the Kennedy School between 1993 and 1996, and then again between 2010 and 2017. Ash was a model in his integrity as a public servant, as President Biden emphasized at the National Cathedral. Ash was a model in his knowledge as a public servant. As others have said, Ash was a model in his work ethic as a public servant. And Ash was a model in his respect for all people who are willing to serve, regardless of their gender, gender identity, or other characteristics. So commitment, integrity, knowledge, work ethic, respect for all. These are the values we are all striving to cultivate in ourselves, and Ash was a model for us. I am so grateful to Ash for being that model public servant. I'm grateful for his insights and wisdom, his generous spirit, and his warm and gracious friendship. I feel so lucky to have known him, and I will miss him very much. But fortunately, Ash's example will continue to inspire me and guide me and to inspire and guide all of us. He will always be in our minds and hearts to remind us how much our work as public servants and scholars can matter. He had an unwavering devotion to making the world better and to writing and teaching and mentoring students as part of that mission. He would want us to keep going. He would expect us to keep going. And so we will. So I think uh, Doug said so eloquently what needs to be said that I should probably simply say amen. But uh, I'm honored to join with colleagues and friends in celebrating the life of a remarkable American, a remarkable pillar of the Harvard Kennedy School and the Belfer Center, and a remarkable friend. Among those of us gathered here, I think I probably knew him the longest and so have the most to be thankful for. Uh, it was almost four decades ago, 1984, uh, when I joined my colleagues Paul Doty and Al Carnesale in recruiting, uh, asked to become an assistant professor. With Al, who was then the academic dean, we mentored uh, what is hard to remember now, but uh, when I go back through this, a young, ambitious, but often awkward and anxious young rising star on an uncharted, uncertain path. In fact, if you go to the Belfort Center, you can see the pictures each year of people, and you see somebody who looks extremely anxious. Okay? We were betting that he could grow up to be a successor to Doty and others leading our science, technology, and public policy initiative. He hoped that by advancing the school's ambition to become a professional school and a thought leader, in analyzing the ways in which science and technology transform both the challenges we face and the opportunities for solutions, that he could become a professor and even a contributor to American national policy. Fortunately, we both won our butts. To paraphrase Gilbert and Sullivan, Ash was the very model of a modern Kennedy School faculty member. As we think about our current faculty, as Doug said, and about new appointments, his career offers a great example of what the school aspires to at our best, not only for our faculty, but for students and fellows. Ash was committed first and foremost to public service, to attempting to make a difference by applying his mind and muscle to making the world a safer planet. He pursued that goal by research, 
that advance knowledge about the most important challenges through teaching and mentoring the next generation of students and fellows, and by engaging policymakers in government. As a result, when he became the 25th Secretary of Defense, he was the best prepared individual ever to have become America's Secretary of Defense. He had worked at every successive level in the Defense Department, after which he had come back to Harvard, to the Belfer Center, had thought about what he had done and learned, had taught about what he had learned, and was prepared to go back again to serve. On the day he died, I was sitting beside him in the Belfer Center Library at one of our director's lunches, where our guest was another Belfer alumni of whom we're proud, Kurt Campbell, who's currently the Deputy National Security Advisor dealing with China for the uh, Biden administration. And as the clock struck one o'clock, Ash turned to me and said, Graham, I've got to go teach my class. You run the rest of the session. Uh, he, with a twinkle in his eye, he ran off to class. Topic that day was cloning CRISPR and implications for human life. That afternoon, he met with students and fellows working on his technology and public policy pur purpose project. He met with research assistants who were helping him prepare to go to Washington the next day for a session at the White House on supply chains. He went home, had dinner with his wife, Stephanie. He took the dog for a walk, he came back to the condo, and he left us. So over these decades, I had a good fortune to work with Ash on scores of projects, both here at the school and in Washington. But I think the one that Ash regarded as his most significant contribution, uh, I'll say a few more words about, because I think we need some more content, and was a challenge posed by the collapse of the Soviet Union on Christmas Day, 1991. And the specter this presented of thousands of nuclear warheads coming loose in the world. The Belfer Center and the Kennedy School can be proud of the research that Ash and colleagues did in sounding the alarm and diagnosing the shape of the problem, and in a piece that he, or uh, a report that he and I co-authored in cooperative denuclearization, outlining a program for addressing this. When President Clinton became president in 1993, the two of us went to the Defense Department as Assistant Secretaries of Defense with a roadmap that was executed over the next several years. At the end of this odyssey, more than 17,000 nuclear warheads that had been left in 14 newly independent countries beyond the border of Russia uh, had been re recovered and mostly destroyed. So it's a long story with many, many twists and turns, but in a nutshell. So after four decades of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, with the threat of nuclear Armageddon hanging over us, the evil empire dissolved. But what was the fate of its nu superpower nuclear arsenal? That was uncertain. In addition to Russia, as I said, there were stockpiles of weapons in 14 newly independent states, 17,000 of them. And as the bumper sticker said, each one of which could spoil your whole afternoon. So in the chaos that accompanied the collapse of an empire, it seemed almost inevitable that there'd be a surge of proliferation of nuclear weapons, and that many of these weapons would find their way into international arms bazaars. Had they done so, the Al-Qaeda attack on 9-11 at the World Trade Center and Pentagon that killed 3,000 people could have extinguished a million people instantly. So despite our best efforts at the Belfer Center to engage the Bush administration in 1991 and 1992, the Bush team was essentially exhausted and became fatalistic. As a reminder of just how fatalistic, it's worth recalling the Sunday television show Face the Nation in December 1991, just two weeks before the Soviet Union actually collapsed. The guest was Bush's Secretary of Defense. His name was Dick Cheney. The moderator asked him what would happen to this superpower arsenal if, as appeared likely, the Soviet Union collapsed. Cheney answered, quote, if the Soviets do, this is a quote, 
If the Soviets do an excellent job of retaining control over their stockpile of nuclear weapons, and they're 99% successful, that would mean you would still have as many as 250 weapons that they're not able to control. Looking shocked, the moderator asked, well, what is the US doing about this? Again, to quote Cheney in his precise words, the only realistic thing for me to do as Secretary of Defense is to anticipate that one of the byproducts of the breakup of the Soviet Union will be this proliferation of nuclear weapons. Fortunately for the nation and the world, two great American senators, uh, Sam Nunn and Dick Lugar, refused to stand by and just let stuff happen. With the help of the Belfer Center, they crafted what's now recognized as the most significant piece of congressionally initiated national security legislation since World War II, what's called Nunn Lugar that funded a program that Ash and I and many other Belfer alumni like Liz Sherwood, Randall, implemented over the next several years. Three decades after Cheney's forecast, how many nuclear weapons from the former Soviet arsenal have proliferated? Not 250 that Cheney predicted, not 25, zero. Miracle of miracles, not a single weapon has been discovered, lost, or for sure exploded. So as those of you worked, who work, have worked in the Pentagon or even in DC know, DC is the land of acronyms. DC. At the Pentagon, the quip says, we suffer from acronymphomania. As a reminder of some of the key attributes of ASH, that I think we should admire, that we admire and should aspire to emulate, let me consider Ashton as an acronym. So A in Ash's word stands for what? First and foremost, for what he and Bill Perry in their book call the A-list. In Ash's view, if you were not working on an A-list problem, you should move over and let somebody else take your space. At the Belfer Center, whose mission is addressing the central challenges to American national security, Ash would say, if the problem that's got your heart ticking is not on the A-list, you should find another topic. And in pursuing A-list issues, Ash insisted and demanded of himself and those with whom he worked A-level performance. Now, of course, he knew that we often fell short of A-level performance. But as a mutual hero of his and mine, Winston Churchill said, and Ash loved the quote, in matters of great importance, it's not enough to do one's best. What's required is that one does what is necessary for success. The S in Ashton stood first and foremost for science. Intellectually, Ash was a physicist, addressed every problem from a physicist's point of view, confident that it was possible to understand the fundamental laws and regularities of nature and ruthlessly following the facts wherever they led. He had an intellectual self-confidence in leaping into every arena, whether economics or statistics or organization theory, he regarded these as sort of, you know, below him, or AI and quantum and synthetic biology, which he was coming to grapple with in the last stage of his life. H, of course, stands for Harvard. Uh, the only bad thing I can say about Ash is that he was educated at Yale and Oxford, but Harvard was Ash's natural home. About our initial efforts to recruit him to the Kennedy School, and then as Doug has said, in 2017 in a campaign that Doug and Lawrence Belfer and I and many others worked on, but that Doug was our leader, there's many tales to tell about the competition with MIT. But the killer argument for Ash, belonging here, was the recollection of Harvard's history of scientists who made legendary contributions to America. From Jim Conant, who was the president of Harvard and who enlisted Harvard in World War II, 
to George Kistiakowski, who was Eisenhower's science advisor, Paul Doty, who was the founder of the Belfer Center, and many, many, many more. Indeed, this was also a killer argument in Ash and my recruiting John Holdren, who succeeded Ash as the head of the Belfer Science and Technology Program, after which he served for eight years as the science advisor for President Obama. The T in Ashton obviously stands for technology. The application of science to shape solutions to the most important problems. When he returned to the Belfer Center as our director, Ash defined what he saw as the next frontier of technology and technology's impact and shaping by public purpose. So he sought to ensure that as technology advances, public purposes and consequences are taken into account and to the extent possible, uh, shape these developments. In his research, writing, and especially the mentoring of the next generation of fellows, Ash was seeking a way to apply lessons learned in his own experience to applying advances uh, to make sure that one takes account of the risks as well as the benefits. O for Ash stood for Omega, with Alpha the beginning and the end. O defines the space outside the box, whether the box has four sides or five in the case of the Pentagon. He recognized that many of the most important solutions lie outside the natural parameters. And with his closest colleague at the Pentagon, Eric Rosenbach, who fortunately is uh, here with us as the co-director of the Belfer Center, they determined at the Pentagon they would not only imagine solutions outside the box, they would actually execute them. Finally, the N for Ashton stood for nation, the USA. Ash's highest aspiration was to serve America's national interest by shaping a world without great power war. He recognized the historical anomaly of 77 years without great power war. He understood in his bones that avoiding war with nuclear-armed Russia and China was not only a good thing, it was absolutely necessary for our own survival, and perhaps even for the survival of the species. Again, to quote Churchill in a line that Ash loved, only in the 20th century did, we, did war enter into its kingdom as the potential destroyer of the human race. As Churchill explained, quote, mankind <clears throat> has never been in this position before without having improved appreciably in our virtue or enjoying wiser guidance, it has gotten into its own hands for the first time the tools by which it can unfailingly accomplish its own extermination. It was thus no accident that the title of the book that Ash and Bill Perry wrote is called Preventive Defense. Ash's premature death stands as a stark reminder for all of us. Life is short. Each human life has an expiration date. Memento mori, or as the scripture instructs us, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Good morning. It's a true privilege to be here with all of you today to remember and to celebrate our dear friend, colleague, and teacher, Ash Carter. In preparing for today, I spent much of Monday locked up in a hotel room reading things that Ash had written corresponding with our colleagues about Ash. 
communicating with students about their memories of ASH and pouring through remembrances that have been written by our students by the dozen. In many ways, I feel like I spent that day with ASH, and I emerged from it feeling very much the same way that I would emerge from any interaction with ASH, smarter for it, inspired to do better, and with a smile on my face, thinking about some goofy comment he made or some funny face he made in describing a, uh, describing a surprising story. So over the last months, we've had many wonderful opportunities to consider what an extraordinary man Ash was. We've listened to the president, the secretary of defense, many other distinguished leaders, some of them here today, describe Ash. And what has been so striking to me is how many people who knew Ash in so many different settings over so many different periods of his life used almost exactly the same adjectives to describe him. They described his ferocious mind, his relentless drive for results, his integrity, his moral compass, and his deep, deep commitment to public service. We've also had the opportunity to reflect on the real significant achievements that Ash has made over the course of his life, be it waging the war against ISIS or the production of thousands of mine-resistant vehicles that saved the lives of many. Ash lived a life that touched thousands, maybe even millions, most of those whom he never met. And I think Graham has done a beautiful job in conveying this to us this morning. But rather than focus on those achievements or on the broad scope of Ash's impact, I want today to give voice to the people who Ash did meet one by one by one. To those touched by Ash in a very individual way, in a personal way, in the classroom, in the Belfer Library, in the hallways, or in office hours. Here in Memorial Church, I want to remember Ash as the colleague, the friend, the mentor, the teacher. Personally, I will always be grateful to Ash for spurring me to do something that I might have not done without his encouragement. I arrived at the Kennedy School after some very difficult years living and working in Iraq and living and working at the White House on Iraq and Afghanistan. Coming to Harvard was, as it has been for all of us, an enormous privilege. I was and am grateful to Graham for the opportunity and also for the chance to return to previous scholarship and to remake myself as an energy person. I had hoped to move on from Iraq and Afghanistan and to fill my mind with other things. When I told, about, when I told Ash about my plans, to create a course and a research project working on energy and geopolitics, he didn't dissuade me. But he urged me to do the same on Iraq and Afghanistan. He argued rightly that I owed it to our students to explain the strategies and the policies that had led to such sacrifice, so much of it very personal to our own students. And he argued rightly that I owed it to myself to reflect deeply about the time that I'd spent in government. And I did just that, and I believe doing so made me a better teacher, a better citizen, a better scholar, and potentially, if I have the chance to make policy again, a better policymaker. Those early years were a gift that very few people ever receive. For so many others working at Belfer, Ash was not just a private encourager, he was a public mobilizer. Steve Miller shared with me a memory which is very relevant to the story that we heard Graham tell us about Ash's deep involvement in laying the seeds for what later became this very consequential non Lugar Soviet nuclear threat initiative. Steve remember, remembers clearly Ash infusing the Belfer Center with a sense of his purpose to produce a monograph, which again, is, as, as Graham has suggested, um, has become ultimately one of the finest examples of the academic world influencing policy. Once done producing this monograph, Steve recalled, and I'm quoting him, Ash took the entire center staff out for a celebratory lunch and was warm and generous in his appreciation of the efforts that all had made to produce and promote our work. 
But an important part of the story is that no one worked harder than Ash himself. He was disciplined, focused, purposeful, and effective. He dragged us all along in his jet stream. That is certainly not hard to imagine for those of us who were not there, because we all loved being dragged along in Ash's jet stream. But as Ash liked to say, his biggest legacy will be his students. In talking with former students and course assistants and research assistants and reading their tributes to Ash, some very, very clear themes emerged. Yes, there were references to Ash being an intellectual giant, and of course, there was deep appreciation for what he taught all of our students and how he taught our students. But what really stood out so very clearly are the memories of warmth, of caring, of encouragement. The memories of office hours and unpredictable chats in the hallway that turn it, uh, turned out to alter the cores of lives have been peppered throughout these remembrances. One former student, Alexander Diavilla, recalls that he had been visiting Harvard not to visit the Kennedy School, but to visit some other schools. And he and his mother took refuge in the Kennedy School courtyard from the blustery wind. And that became the setting for a chance encounter with Ash as he left the building. After a few minutes of talking to Alex, Ash said, you know, Alex, I really think you belong here. Please think seriously about applying to the Kennedy School. And Alex applied, got in, came, later became Ash's course assistant, and is now working at the Pentagon. And in Alex's own words, it's amazing to consider how impactful a simple 10-minute interaction with Ash could be. One of the clearest things that came through in these exchanges with students is how interacting with Ash made students feel respected and more confident in their ability to change the world. Over and over again, the sentiment, he gave me confidence in myself because of the confidence he had in me, came through. And over and over again, students described Ash not as the towering figure that he indeed was, but as a proud parent, literally a proud parent, gushing with excitement and enthusiasm for what lay ahead for each of them. In remembering Ash, many of our students were bowled over by his willingness to support them directly, personally, and persistently. So in hearing from students, it does seem that Ash had a little bit of an opening line in office hours, and I think it went something like this. My only question to you is this, what can I do to help you get where you are going? I'm ready to make the calls, what's the plan? But to say that was an opening line is not to diminish that the support that Ash was expressing was indeed genuine, and he proved over and over again that he was willing to stand by it with many more students than we will ever count. Vidya Nilankatan, another, another course assistant, had this to say, Ash had a way of making people feel like he was part of their career journey, and I didn't realize until he was gone how it felt like a load had been a little bit lighter whenever I thought about my career because I felt like Ash was on my team. Before I graduated, he pulled me into his office to ask me a favor. The favor was that I needed to make sure to keep him posted on my career. He said to me, you and I are in the same business, which is to further your career. So keep me company in this effort, okay? That was the favor, to let him help me, and he made good on it. Finally, we all remember Ash as a champion of inclusion, particularly of women, whether it be through the student group Women in Defense, Diplomacy, and Development, or the way in which he relentlessly worked to create an inclusive environment in the classroom. In the words of another student, I think of Ash as the OG feminist. With him, it wasn't performative or about statistics or the product of some desire to prove his woke credentials. He just generally sought out talent, and lo and behold, he seemed to find as many talented women to champion as he did men. So in closing, I'd like to close as so many of our students closed in their remembrances of Ash, and that is by thanking him. I'd like to thank Ash for the amazing contributions he made to our country and to the domain of knowledge. But I'd also like to thank Ash for being human, for being proud of us all, for being confident in our ability to change the course of history for the good, and for holding so many of our hands in the process of doing so.
Hello, thank you for being here today. Uh, the last few months have been pretty tough for me, and I'm very lucky to be part of a supportive community full of wonderful people. Thank you for all your support. Ash and I were very close. I knew him for almost 20 years. We worked. <clears throat> We worked side by side for every day for almost nine years. And we had a lot in common. We both grew up in Pennsylvania. Our birthdays were one day apart. We were badly lapsed Catholics. Sorry, Father. And we held the same job as Assistant Secretary of Defense. But there was something more, there was something deeper that made us an exceptional team and unusually close friends. Our strengths complement each other. <clears throat> Our weaknesses covered for each other. We talked about almost everything. <laughs> Steph, his wife, often joked that we were like two peas in a pod. <laughs> and we were so close that to my chagrin, I ended up being called Sweet Pea. <laughs> Ash and I spent so much time together in the Pentagon that people often confused us. <laughs> Several times, for example, I would be the first one off the plane in some foreign location, and the officer in charge would strike up the band and say, Mr. Secretary, welcome to our post. We are so happy to have a visit by the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> and I would think to myself, do I really already look that old? <laughs> so it's hard to find words to celebrate someone you've been so close to for so long. And I mean, what can you say after such moving comments by his family, his wife, the Dean of the Kennedy School, the President of the United States, and so many others? I visited uh, Ash's class at HKS the first day after he passed. We were all still in shock and struggled with the question of how to pay tribute to someone who had such a huge impact on both the world and our individual lives. And during that tear field session, tear field session one student said that the best way to honor someone is to think of the five things that you learned from them. Well, with that in mind, I'd like to present three lessons for the students, and only three, because as anyone knows who's taken my class, there's never any good reason to have more than three points in any public speech. <laughs> the first thing that I want students to know is that Ash worked really, really, hard. He, of course, was brilliant, but what too few people know is that it was his work ethic that allowed him to accomplish so many things in life that mattered to him. Thomas Edison once said that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. No one captures the essence of this quote better than Ash Carter. In the halls of the Pentagon, Ash was seen as more of an innovator than a Harvard intellectual. He was willing to try, willing to fail, and above all else, willing to work even harder to make the organization better. Simply put, he was the hardest working boss and friend I've ever known. A story recently shared by Secretary of Defense Bill Perry demonstrates this point exactly. According to Perry, Ash had, at his request, authored an important analysis of President Reagan's strategic defense initiative, known as Star Wars. But contrary to public lore, Ash's paper was not techn technically accurate. Ash was crushed when Perry told him. Yet Perry took Ash under his wing and mentored him for decades because he saw just how committed, devoted, and how hardworking he was. Even when in physical pain, Ash maintained his relentless drive. When he got the call from President Obama to serve as his Secretary of Defense, Ash had just undergone major back surgery. Major, as in the surgeons fully replaced one third of his spine 
with a titanium implant. I used to joke with Ash that he was literally the bionic man. And as you can imagine though, this made the first six, months, first six months of his tenure as secretary extremely challenging. Those first six months, we worked every single day, usually more than 14 hours a day, but we had to stop every hour or two to allow him to lay down on the floor so that he could rest his back. Even after major spinal replacement surgery, Ash had the grit and work ethic to continue driving the ideas he believed in. Ash was a taskmaster. One of his favorite sayings in the Pentagon was that this needs to be 100% buttoned down. When I was first appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber Policy, I quickly learned that in any meeting with Ash, you needed to carefully watch whenever he wrote something in his black moleskin notebook. Why? Because every time he took a note, it was a task with a little open box and he assiduously followed up on every single tasking. His black book was about getting things done, not grand ideas. The tasks he neatly penned in his book were so central to our work in the Pentagon and here at Harvard that I eventually asked him to take a picture of each page every Sunday night so that we could actually keep up with him during the next week. Our core team in the Pentagon stuck very loyally with him because we knew he was willing to put in the work on those tasks too. Even when it bordered on the insane. <laughs> At the beginning of one epic trip around the world, about which you'll hear many more stories, for example, Ash gleefully burst into our classified conference room in the plane and explained to us that we could set the world record for the number of hours worked in one day. His logic was that since we had already worked several hours, we would cross the international dateline in flight, and we had a 22-hour flight ahead of us, complements of Air Force refueling ops, that we could pretty easily work for about 38 hours in one day. <laughs> Second, Ash's irrepressible urge for action and crushing bureaucratic obstacles was inspiring. He knew ideas alone were worthless unless a, a leader drove their execution, and he relished that role. During the National Memorial Service for Ash a few weeks ago, President Biden perfectly captured Ash's dedication to execution by saying that he was a force of nature. One of the things that I most respected about Ash was that he was predisposed for action. And because he had so much experience working in the bureaucracy of the government and Harvard, which we always joked made the Pentagon bureaucracy look easy, <laughs> is that he was intolerant of excuses and incompetence. One of my fondest memories of Ash, when he, as Deputy Secretary, would personally call me to his office directly on a Monday morning and say, hey brother, let's get something done on cyber this week. You tell me what you want to do and I'll flatten anyone who gets in your way. <laughs> Needless to say, the hundreds of staffers and bureaucrats in the Department of Defense who worked on cyber issues were not thrilled with this arrangement. But the results were significant. We established U.S. Cyber Command, the first ever cyber rules of engagement, and pushed the entire interagency to push back forcefully on China's cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property. Ash did not suffer fools. He held people accountable. This was particularly important to civil-military relations. Unlike many civilian political appointees, Ash was unafraid to take on senior uniform military leaders. With decades of experience under his belt, Ash saw that the civ mill balance had tilted too far to the side of the uniformed general officers making important decisions. As such, one of his primary goals of secretary was to rebalance civilian control in the areas of policy, strategy, and execution. The fact that this balance was restored by the time he left was a tribute to his force of personality. The most dramatic instances 
of his push to reset the sieve mill balance occurred in the regular operational updates we established to keep ASH abreast of the progress we were making in the war to destroy ISIS. During these updates, Ash was always at his best. He would regularly question the assumptions of the commanders and always push them to do more. And in one very memorable case, I recall him stating, excuse me, Admiral, what I just gave was not a polite suggestion, but a direct order. And if you can't follow it, I'll find someone who will. And do you know what? When that person didn't follow the order, he went to President Obama and recommended the person to be removed. Um, as many of you know, and others of you can imagine, Ash's force of nature sometimes turned out to be a fierce hailstorm on his staff. But inevitably, that hailstorm would pass, and the next day, he'd give you a big hug and say, okay, brother, what are we gonna do today? But for some, those sec deaf hugs were more terrifying than any public reprimand. <laughs> Once, a very prominent four-star general asked me to please tell the secretary not to hug me in front of the troops. <laughs> he told me he would prefer 1,000 times over for the secretary to yell at him in a stadium full of people and the New York Times than to be hugged. It's bad for deterrence, the general said. <laughs> Third and final lesson is that students should remember that Ash had a true zest for life. He was serious and ambitious, but he wanted to have fun while doing it all. As he often told his students, don't get caught speeding, but always speed. <laughs> Ash wanted to live every day like it was his last. As secretary, he hated being in stuffy meetings in the White House in Washington, D.C. He wanted to be out in the real world where he could be the tip of the spear for America's most pressing national interests. And he could also have a lot more fun. <laughs> By his last year in office, we had perfected the art of the SecDef trip around the world, um, which quite frankly often seemed like a modern day version of a Jules Verne novel. So from giving a speech to Xi Jinping on the deck of an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea, to waving to Kim Jong-un while dangling his toe into North Korea over the DMZ, to taunting Benjamin Netanyahu for being a lame soccer player at Ash's rival high school in Pennsylvania, to excoriating Mohammed bin Salman who offered to replace my rickety eyeglasses, Ash wanted to be out in the real world. The tail end of one of these epic trips stands out to me as particularly characteristic of Ash. He wanted to go to Norway to signal his personal support for the excellent Norwegian Minister of Defense, Ina Soraide, the first ever woman to hold that position. But he also wanted the Russians to puzzle over why the SecDef would go to the Arctic Circle to a semi-secret submarine base and and he wanted to parachute out of a Norwegian special ops plane into the fjords. That's right, Ash, with the bionic back, wanted to do a static line parachute jump in a special forces plane into the fjords of Norway. After some intense bushpack from both his chief of staff and the trip doctor, we, he begrudgingly accepted that um, we would do a plan in which a special ops speedboat was dropped out of a plane, which would zoom up to us, pick him and all of us up, and then zoom around the fjords conducting mock assault drills. Later that evening, just as we thought we were finally done with the trip, 
and we were getting ready to sleep on the flight home, something we didn't do very often, we got word that the president wanted to hold a special National Security Council meeting on a possible ceasefire agreement with the Russians in Syria. Completely exhausted from nonstop days and several nights of less than three hours of sleep, Ash lay on the floor of our plane and participated in a nearly four-hour-long NSC meeting in which he vociferously argued with Secretary John Kerry that we could not trust the Russians ever in any way, but particularly not when they were hacking our elections at the exact same time. Those images of Ash grinning from ear to ear while bouncing around a fjord in Norway, and then jousting with Secretary Kerry with an aching back and the last ounce of energy in his soul are indelible and emblematic of his approach to life. So those are three lessons that the students should learn from Ash. First, your perspiration, it matters more than your inspiration. Second, strategy execution often requires a force of nature. Third, you should always grab life by the reins. Those lessons are important, but I think Ash would want me, and me in particular, to add an important corollary to the third lesson. Don't wait until you're at the point in life when you have the reins firmly in hand to make time for all the people around you. The pandemic forced all of us to think hard about life, family, friends, love, and legacy. I suspect Ash reflected a lot on these topics during the pandemic. And over the past year or so of his life, the last year or so of his life, he was happier than I'd ever seen him. I saw him express renewed gratitude to the people who had helped him. And his priority became his family, helping the people who'd supported him throughout his amazing career. And, as you've heard, shaping the next generation of leaders here at Harvard. He embraced these people in a way that was genuine, warm, and heartfelt. Ash left us too soon, but knowing Ash, I think he left at peace with everything he'd done in life. And that makes me happy. Thank you, Ash, for everything. I miss you, brother. This church was founded and is dedicated to those in our community who gave their lives in service to this nation. Their names are written on the walls. And though the circumstances are different, Ash Carter joins their number, one of our own, who gave himself to national service and whose name remains forever written upon our hearts. I invite you, therefore, to join me in a moment of silent reflection and prayer. O oh, gracious love, we gratefully recall our friend and brother Ashton Baldwin Carter, all that he was and is to us, all that he stood for in this world. As we depart this church and return to our lives, may we live ever more constantly in the companionship of Ash's spirit and in the blessing of his memory. May we resolve to carry out as much of his purpose as we can. 
May we be kind to the people he loved, devoted to the communities in and for which he lived, loyal to the causes he served. Thus, in what remains of our days, may he still live on in us to our own comfort and for the welfare of the world he has departed. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, and let light perpetual shine upon him. May his soul and the souls of all the beloved departed rest in peace. Amen. And now may the peace of that gracious love which passes all our understanding and which has welcomed Ash into its eternal embrace be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.